All right. Hey, everybody. Hope that uh, that your first day of doing this at-home online learning thing is going okay, not just in my class, but in your other ones, too. Um, it seemed like everybody was able to uh, to view the, the first lecture, so that's good. Um, I think I'd put on, uh, on Google Class, if anything's going wrong and you have any questions or you can't get access to anything, please just shoot me an email. A uh, couple other things. Um, if you didn't see it on Google Class, I uploaded a PDF of the entire Chapter 36 packet. So if you are missing a piece or you forgot to bring the, the packet home, um, it's available for you online. And I'll be doing that going forward as well for Chapter 37. Um, I'm sure you all saw that we got confirmation that we're not going to be in class until at least the 30th. So we will definitely be moving forward into Chapter 37. Um, another word on that, just while, uh, while we're getting started, before we dive into uh, the last of Eisenhower and his foreign policy. So you know you have a DBQ coming up. Um, what we're going to do with multiple choice tests and things like that is um, I'm actually going to hold off on them. Um, we're only going to do written things until you get back to school. Um, when you do get back, I think what we're going to do, though, is a longer multi-chapter, multi-unit, multiple-choice test. Okay, um, We'll prep for it. We'll be ready to go. But I actually think in some ways it'll be a blessing in disguise. Uh, you guys have been taking you know, two-chapter tests at a clip. So I actually think it would be a good thing to do one that's a little bit longer um, in prep for the AP exam, all right? Um, I'm not just saying that to try to make the best of things. I, I honestly think that that would be a good idea. Um, so don't worry about it yet. We've got plenty of time. Obviously, we're not sure when we're getting back. But, um, but that's what we're going to do uh, for the multiple choice things. Um, I also saw something today for what it's worth that the college board is starting to look at potentially pushing back the exam or coming up with some way to modify it. So, um, so the good news is at least they're, they're aware that they need to, to hopefully do something to, to make this a little easier on you guys. Um, but you know, going forward, we'll just keep plugging on. Uh, we'll keep moving through our content. Um, next week, I'll make sure that we'll have some reviews um, there'll be video reviews like this, but I'll make sure that we, we do the reviews that were scheduled on your calendar, um, and uh, and we'll go from there. We'll just we'll keep getting through it. All right. So we just gotta we just gotta kind of stick it out. Um, okay. So let's uh, so let's finish up the Eisenhower foreign policy content, shall we? Um, if you haven't already, why don't you hit pause on the video? And why don't you grab your John Foster Dulles reading and um, your George Kennan reading and the comparisons that hopefully you guys were able to jot some notes down for and set up. Um, I think I had said at the, the lecture that I posted for Monday uh, that we talk a little bit about the John Foster Dulles uh, document before we dove into some of the new content. We don't have a lot of new content today either. Um, okay. So the... Uh, so the new document, the Dulles document, as we know, um, has to do with this concept of massive retaliation or brinksmanship, right? Um, and really, this is a, a big shift. And, uh, and these are some of the things that I, I thought you should take out of this. Um, the biggest one is that whereas Truman and Kennan wanted to prevent communism uh, from spreading, by even intervening militarily with like ground troops, uh, with the Air Force, you know, with, with, with what are sometimes called conventional weapons, non-nuclear weapons. Um, Dulles and Eisenhower start to develop a really kind of more aggressive approach. Um, so, you know, Dulles talked a lot about cost, and, and this is one of the big things you should have noted as a difference. Um, Truman and Kennan basically said, we're going to intervene anywhere we need to and keep troops there if it means stopping communism from spreading. Uh, Dulles does not think that's a good idea. Um, hopefully, as you read, you, you took out of this that Dulles believes that it's not practical, that it's too expensive, and that the Soviets are um, basically too aggressive to just kind of wait for them to try to expand somewhere and then go in and intervene militarily. Um, and that's, that's kind of the idea behind massive retaliation. So basically what Dulles comes up with is um, 
this idea that rather than using troops, we should just build up a massive, massive nuclear arsenal. Um, and the idea would be if the Soviets ever intervened anywhere where they were expanding communism or got too aggressive, um, they would hopefully be deterred by the fact that, oh, see, I got to silence my phone. Um, just like in school, right? Um, but, uh, but what Dulles basically came up with was this idea that we need to have plenty of nuclear weapons, um, and that way the Soviets will never try to get aggressive anywhere because we can basically threaten them with like complete annihilation. Um, if it sounds extreme, you, you get it. That is very extreme. Um, but the argument that Dulles made was that it's cheaper to build up lots and lots of nuclear weapons than it is to maintain troops all over the world. Um, and, uh, and that was kind of his point. So in particular, if you look at the second page of the two, the back page, uh, it's numbered 463. Um, he talks very specifically about costs in Korea, costs of defending the world, um, and makes this argument that when he says things like adequate striking power, um, he's talking about nuclear weapons. Um, and, uh, and that was kind of the, the new shift. Now, there's a lot of downsides to this, and, and that's really what the second half of this lecture is going to be. Um, so why don't, we, uh, why don't we dive into it a little bit? So this man is Nikita Khrushchev. Um, he is the first leader of the Soviet Union after Stalin. Um, when Stalin dies, there's a power struggle, and Khrushchev takes over. Um, Khrushchev is a, uh, a little bit less aggressive than Stalin, but let's face it, that's not saying much since we know who Stalin is. Um, and Khrushchev is going to be the Soviet uh, leader throughout Eisenhower's administration and the conflicts that we're going to talk about in a minute, um, and also throughout Kennedy's administration. So this is the, the Soviet leader who is in charge during a lot of the, the biggest conflicts of the early Cold War, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, the U-2 incident that we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, the Berlin Wall being constructed, you know, this, this is going to be the opponent of, of the American presidents and the government um, for the next basically 10 years. So um, one of the biggest parts of this plan to create massive retaliation as the new theory was, as I said, the buildup of nuclear weapons. But one of the scarier parts of this is that you saw the Soviets and the Americans building up more what are called tactical nuclear weapons. Um, what that means is these are nuclear weapons that aren't just used against cities, um, like the duck and cover, right? Um, up until this point, both the Americans and the Soviets only made what were called strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, and what that meant was they would only be used to uh, destroy cities, which I know sounds really terrible, but um, in a strange way, it was actually safer. And this is what I mean. So strategic weapons are controlled by the leader of the country, the president or the Soviet premier. What that means is they have to approve it. There's a whole process. Um, you can't just launch them, all right? Um, it takes people to confirm it. You know, basically it's a whole bunch of different safeties so that we don't accidentally have a nuclear war. Um, as part of this threat against the Soviets, to um, use nuclear weapons more aggressively if, if they tried to expand, uh, both sides began to make tactical weapons. Um, so what you're looking at is actually a picture of a US weapon. It's a nuclear bomb that you could just fire from a cannon. They called it Atomic Annie. Um, and what the US did was they built dozens of these uh, nuclear cannons basically all over Europe as a way to try to stop any Soviet aggression. Um, the problem with this is that these aren't controlled by the president. These are controlled by like lower level military guys. So you could very easily see, you know, someone making a mistake, thinking maybe the Soviets were getting aggressive. Um, you know, the, the point is in a, a moment of confusion, a low level person could accidentally start a nuclear war now. So this was not, you know, uh, an ideal situation. Um, the Soviets also did this. Uh, they didn't build like nuclear cannons. What those are are um, short range nuclear missiles. And, uh, and as you can see, they just mount them on the back of 18 wheelers. Uh, these also were really scary 
because um, the Soviets could move them constantly. So you couldn't even really keep track of where they were. So um, same type of thing on the Soviet side. If one of their low-level military commanders got nervous and thought that you know an attack was imminent, um, technically he could launch one of these without getting approval from the from the Kremlin, from Khrushchev and the Soviet leadership. So we're entering this like much more dangerous phase of uh, of the Cold War because a lot of the traditional checks um, on potentially starting a war start to get removed for a period of time. Um, so. During uh, Eisenhower's uh, second term, primarily, uh, you see four really major incidents occur that start to raise the tensions in the country and in the world uh, to a, a new height. Um, and all of these are also going to lead to a lot of the issues that Kennedy is going to deal with in the first two years of his administration. Um, so the first one, I'm sure you've heard of, Sputnik, uh, is a kind of like a morale loss for the United States. It's not necessarily a, uh, a major threat, um, but, but indirectly it could be seen as one. So, so let's talk about this. Um, Sputnik is the first man-made satellite put into orbit successfully by anyone. Um, the U.S. had tried and blew up a whole bunch of satellites on launch pads. They hadn't developed the technology at that point. So the Russians beat the United States to space. Um, and Sputnik was the name of the satellite. Um, I'll show it to you in a minute. It's not all that scary. It's literally a giant metal basketball that beeps. Um, the, the real threat of Sputnik is not the satellite itself, though. It's the, the rocket that it's launched on, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, at the same time, we know that the, the first Berlin crisis had been over the Berlin airlift. Um, Khrushchev, in an effort to intimidate the United States starts to make threats about potentially moving on Berlin again. Um, and while it doesn't happen during Eisenhower's administration, it will happen during Kennedy's. Um, but during Eisenhower's administration is when this begins. So this is another thing that, that you know, kind of accelerates this, this shift to massive retaliation. Um, in addition to that, uh, in Cuba, there is a revolution that overthrows the U.S.-backed leader, a guy by the name of Batista. Um, now, we'll go into this in a little more depth when we talk about Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, because I think it's more relevant there. But just know that Fidel Castro and the communists take over right at the end of um, Eisenhower's administration. The real big one, though, is uh, what's called the U-2 spy plane incident, um, where an American spy plane is going to be shot down in the Soviet Union and the pilot's going to be captured. Um, this is going to really cause a failure... Um, not just for like the American spy um, like forces, you know, the CIA and the military, but um, it's actually going to be a major diplomatic failure too, because at the time Eisenhower and Khrushchev were about to discuss potentially, you know, lowering tensions, um, and uh, and so this kind of you know throws a wrench in it. Um, but let's let's look at all these individually together. So that is Sputnik. Um, as you can see, it's not very large, um, it's not all that intimidating, it's not a weapon, like I said, literally a metal ball that beeps. Um, the real threat or the real kind of, um, you know, scare for the United States was not necessarily the satellite itself, though it did mean that the Soviets had more advanced satellites at the time. Um, they were still very, very primitive, though, compared to today, you know, no cameras or anything like that. Um, the real threat has to do with this. So that's the rocket that the uh, Sputnik satellite was launched on. Um, and think about it, you know, if you can use a rocket to put a satellite into space, you can also use that rocket to put a nuclear weapon into an enemy's country. Um, and, you know, the thing that makes these different is, let's face it, you're not going to be able to shoot down a missile, right? Um, at least not in the 1950s and 60s. Um, you know, planes... Obviously, you know, if one got through, it would be devastating, but at least you could see the planes coming. The scary thing about these missiles is that um, you couldn't really detect them. You could figure out that they were launched, but you couldn't tell where they were headed, uh, and there was really no possible way to shoot them down. Um, so really, when Sputnik was launched, um, even if the American public didn't totally understand it, the military understood that what this meant was that the Soviets now had missile capabilities where they could shoot nuclear weapons at the United States and they would definitely get through. 
Um, and the U.S., for at least a brief period of time, did not have that capability yet. So Sputnik kind of represented a, a security threat in that sense. And, you know, you think about it. In 1945, the United States is the only country that has nuclear weapons in the world. Um, and no one had the technology to hit the U.S., nor had nuclear weapons to do it with. And now we're not even in 1960 yet. So in, you know, 15 years, basically, the U.S. goes from being the only nuclear power in the world to um, one of a couple of nuclear powers and also being able to be bombed itself. Um, so, so this is, you know, something that contributes to the Red Scare. It contributes to the increased defense spending and, and also Dulles's plan to, uh, to expand this idea of massive retaliation. Um, so these are just some headlines. Um, one of the things that, that Americans were worried about was uh, also the fact that eventually these satellites would be able to hold cameras, things like that. So there was a fear that they would help the Russians spy. Um, again, heightening the, the fears about the Red Scare. Um, it also meant that at some point someone was going to be able to put a person into space. So, um, you know, this was seen as a, a pretty major kind of, you know, at least morale defeat for the United States. Um, it directly leads to a huge increase in um, not just defense spending, but also the federal government starting to provide funding for engineering and science and, uh, and technology classes in universities. Um, you see a lot of um, money pumped into to engineering and like physics programs and things like that. Because part of the thought was that maybe we were falling behind um, academically as well. You know, we didn't have enough people going into those fields. Um, so this brings us to the U-2. Uh, so this is the U-2 spy plane. Um, while the United States had an advantage over the Soviet Union, or excuse me, while the Soviet Union had an advantage over the United States in rocket technology, the United States still had an advantage in planes and aeronautical technology. Um, and this spy plane was, at the time, the most advanced plane in the world. Um, what you were able to do with this was the Americans figured out that it, with this spy plane, you could fly over the Soviet Union at such a height that they couldn't shoot it down. Um, it flew at like 70 to 80,000 feet in the air, um, basically right at the edge of the atmosphere. It wasn't very fast, but at the time, um, the Soviets didn't have any planes that could get that high, um, and they actually didn't have any missiles that could get that high and also track the plane. Obviously, you know, they had a missile that could launch Sputnik, but it's very different trying to get a missile that can actually like home in on a plane. Um, and, and at least at first, the Soviets didn't have anything. Um, the other thing about this plane that made it so valuable is that at the same time, the United States had developed um, kind of like the 50s and 60s equivalent of um, like HD cameras. Uh, so you could mount a camera in this plane and from 80,000 feet up, you could take photographs of the Soviet Union. Um, and the photographs were so detailed to give you an idea, you could literally see, um, like the shadows of people on the ground. So the point is it was very, very high definition. Um, and throughout the mid to late fifties, the U S began this project where, um, bit by bit, these planes would fly over the Soviet union and try to photograph all the military sites. So the U S basically tried to create a photo map of the entire Soviet union as a way to tell how many troops they had, where the missiles were, where their planes were. Um, it was a huge, huge strategic advantage to be able to do that. And the funny thing about it is like the Soviet Union knew that the U.S. was doing it because they could track the planes on radar. They just couldn't shoot at them. Um, but they didn't want to tell everybody because if they accused the U.S. of doing this, it would show the world that the United States had you know, better technology in this field. Um, and the U.S. knew that the Soviets knew too, but no one really talked about it whenever there were diplomatic meetings. So it was kind of like an open secret between the two countries. Um, but as you get your way towards the, the mid-19, or excuse me, the late 1950s, early 1960s, the Soviets got pretty close to shooting a couple of these down. Um, and the CIA actually recommended to Eisenhower not to do any more of these missions. Um, and you guessed it, uh, Eisenhower authorized one more mission um, you couldn't make this up if you tried. Uh, and it was over a couple of high-value military targets. Um, and so they send this one more mission with a, a pilot by the name of Francis Gary Powers. 
And that's the mission where the Soviets finally figured out how to shoot these down. Um, so they shot the plane down. Um, and at first, no one really knew what happened. Uh, because obviously the plane got blown up, so the radio was destroyed. Um, the Americans assumed that the plane had been uh, completely destroyed, so you couldn't tell whose plane it was. They assumed the pilot had been killed. Um, and then Eisenhower makes a mistake. Uh, they, uh, the Eisenhower administration lies in the international community. And what they say is that they lost a NASA weather plane, that it disappeared off the radar, they had no idea what happened. They thought maybe it flew into the Soviet Union. Um, and they basically told the world, yeah, we think we might have lost like a scientific research plane. Uh, what they didn't know was that not only had the plane crashed in the Soviet Union relatively intact. I mean, you see the plane there. Um, but all of the sensitive equipment had been saved. Um, the pilot, Francis Gary Powers, had actually survived the drop from 80,000 feet. He bailed out and survived. Um, and then, to make matters worse, uh, all of these spies, all these pilots were given um, like pills where they could commit suicide, like a cyanide pill. Um, all the spies in the Cold War were given them on both sides. And he chose not to use it. Um, so the Soviets captured him alive. And he was in good enough condition where he could be interrogated. And obviously they figured out right away he was a spy. So after Eisenhower announced to the international community that this had happened, um, Khrushchev called him out and caught the U.S. in a lie. Um, they put all of the, um, the gear, you know, all of the wreckage from the plane in this giant convention center in Moscow, kind of like the Jacob Javits Center in New York City. They held a big expo so everybody could see it. Um, it was a, a huge embarrassment to the United States, and it was a major prestige blow, too, because Eisenhower got caught in this lie, um, and it completely torpedoes the peace talks. Um, they take propaganda photos, that's powers with the wreckage, to kind of make sure everybody knew beyond a doubt that it was an American spy plane. Um, they take powers, uh, they have him uh, conduct interviews and show the plane and explain how it was shot down. Um, and they even put him on trial. That's him on trial. And, uh, and they sentence him to 10 years for espionage. Ultimately, the United States will trade for him because it's obviously a bad look to have an American pilot captured in the Soviet Union and they'll trade him for a Soviet spy. Um, but, uh, but the point is like going into 1960, when the election that Kennedy will get elected in, um, occurs, it's, uh, it's, it's a really rough time for the United States foreign policy-wise because um, basically, you know, the U.S. had suffered this major, major prestige hit. Um, and the icing on the cake is that in Cuba, at the exact same time, Fidel Castro had taken over. And what this is going to lead to is a, a series of showdowns between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in Cuba and in Europe in the early 1960s that today historians see as the, the really biggest, um, biggest risks of, you know, a nuclear war. You know, basically 1960 to 1963 is the height of the Cold War in that sense. Um, so that's going to kind of wrap up Eisenhower and foreign policy for us, all right? Um, we'll be doing some other things uh, in, uh, in Chapter 36, and we'll be looking into um, some more domestic issues, particularly with civil rights. Uh, but I wanted to kind of wrap up the, the foreign policy component before we, uh, we get into the DBQ on, uh, on Friday, all right? Um, now, uh, before I, uh, I kind of sign off and, and end this, um, just a couple of things, and this will be on, on Google Classroom as well, but, uh, but I figure since you're listening to me, we might as well go over it anyway. Um, so you know that you're going to have your DBQ this Friday, all right? Um, on Wednesday this week, you are going to uh, have some time to work on chapter 36, and you should finish outlining and taking notes on Eisenhower's foreign policy, all right? So that's your only work for Wednesday is, you know, take the 45 minutes that would be in class and, and finish your notes, all right? Or at least finish the foreign policy ones if you haven't gotten started yet. Um, on Thursday, and I will put details up on Google Class, the game plan is to review the way to write a DBQ um, I will post the DBQ rubric, um, and I'm actually working on, you know, we talked in class about setting up a, uh, a conference call. 
Um, so I'm working on figuring out how to do that to make sure that you can all get on. Or if I have to do a couple of sessions, we'll do that. Um, but, you know, something will happen where we'll be able to review how to write a DBQ. Um, and also, if you have any particular questions about Cold War foreign policy, um, we'll make sure that we can do that as well. OK. Um, and then on um, uh, Friday, after we've reviewed that on Thursday, you'll write the DBQ. Um, and if you saw, I posted an update for the week just to give you a rough idea of what was coming. Um, you'll have to write the DBQ sometime between 8 a.m. and noon. Um, you will get one hour to write it, but it can be any hour in there, from 8 to 9, from 11 to 12, or any hour in between. Um, and it doesn't have to start on the hour either. You know, you could do 8.30 to 9.30. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but the point is you have to do it in that four-hour period, all right, so that I can monitor everybody. Um, so I think that's that for now, all right? Uh, hang in there. Like I said, hope everything's going well with your other classes. Uh, do not hesitate to email me. A whole bunch of you guys emailed me throughout the day today just to check in and clarify things. That was great. Um, keep doing that, all right? And, uh, and we'll go from there, okay? So, uh, so I will talk to you soon. And, uh, and, and I'll, uh, well, yeah, we'll go from there. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Okay.